Welcome to Art 101. This is the first lecture, even though it says chapter two. Uh, and the chapters are referring to a textbook, but I'm no longer using a textbook in the class because it's not being made. So no worries about following along with the textbook. Um, as far as definitions go, uh, I'll have in bold um, definitions for certain terms. So when you're listening to a lecture, you'll want to take notes on those definitions because that'll be some of the test questions. So starting out with Art 101, uh, one of the things that we want to do is developing visual literacy. Uh, and we'll have assignments as the class go along that helps us um, in the discussions to develop visual literacy as well. So some of the subjects that we're going to be talking about in this lecture are words and images. Uh, we'll talk about describing the world. In other words, how artists describe the world. Uh, I have definitions for representational, abstract, and non-objective art. We'll also see some, some examples. Uh, we'll look at the meaning of form and content. And this is pretty basic stuff to understand. We'll keep referring to it throughout the class. Conventions and art. Uh, and we're talking about art conventions, not meetings for artists. Uh, iconography. Um, and then we'll kind of put it all together at the end. Um, the old textbook used to have these sections called the critical process. And it's a good way to put some of the ideas together and apply it to some images that we're going to look at. So we'll think about visual con conventions at the end. So words and images. Uh, this is a pretty famous painting. Uh, and I can guarantee that you've seen this artist, Rene Magritte, before, but not necessarily this image. Uh, so it's called The Treason of Images. Uh, and it says, Ceci ne... <laughs> I haven't done French for a bit. Uh, Ceci ne, ne pas une pipe. Um, so what that means literally is this is not a pipe. Um, so what do you think that could mean? Um, so this might be something you might want to uh, think about to yourself and pause the video and try to come up with some answers. We're looking at a picture of a pipe and then he says, it's not a pipe. So what do you think? Pause here. And then when you're ready, start it up again. Um, and I think what he's trying to say here is that if you go up to this pipe, um, this really realistic picture of a pipe and you try to grab it, put some tobacco in it and smoke it, you will not be able to do that. Uh, and the reason why is because it's an image, which seems obvious to say. Um, but if you think about it, um, image is something that's sometimes portrayed. You can look at it in society. Uh, you can look at it in pictures and art. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily match up with uh, what's actually there. Um, so he's making um, kind of a wider point with a simple little trick uh, a cute little joke in in his um, in his picture. So this relates to visual literacy in that sometimes when you look at pictures of things, they may look really real. Uh, in visual literacy, we kind of understand how to read those images, uh, what they could mean, uh, and to be able to connect them to um, what it could mean for the artist, the intention, or what it could mean for the audience. And those aren't always the same things. So some cultures, they don't use images. Uh, so Islamic culture, uh, in general, images are not allowed, according to Islam. Um, and that has to do with making graven images. Uh, so in other words, you can't make pictures of people. Uh, you can't make pictures of animals and such. Um, so uh, there's a few exceptions, like uh, more modern Iran, um, there's some images that you'll see. And then there's Mughal art that we'll look at later in the class uh, where you can see images. Uh, but generally images are not allowed uh, and the words and the images stay separate. But some of you may be able to read Arabic, um, maybe not in this form, <laughs> but some of you may not, but you can still get something out of the calligraphy that we see here. Uh, because even though images of people and animals and such aren't allowed in Islam, um, these beautiful calligraphies and designs do make an image of sorts. Uh, so you can appreciate things. If you know what the words mean, you can appreciate that. 
Uh, but you can also appreciate the writing um, as an image. So this next picture we're gonna look at is an artist, Lorna Simpson, um, who actually is very interested in the ideas between connections of words and images, and sometimes with how words can have different meanings. Um, so this one's called necklines, and the old text I used to use says that it relates to the violent subtext of African-American experience. So another good, good thing to do here would be to pause uh, and kind of think about what some of the words might mean um, and think about how it might be connected to the imagery. So pause here and then start again in a moment. So now we start again, I'll just take one of the words uh, and relate it to the image possibly and relate it to this idea of the violent subtext of African-American experience. So necktie, you can see that could be related to who wears a necktie. Uh, business people wear neckties. Uh, you could see it as when this was made in 1989, when Lorna Simpson was trying to make it as an artist, it's kind of a symbol of trying to make it, or maybe um, for black people trying to make it in society in general. But necktie can also have a more gruesome meaning. It could be related to hanging um, or lynches. So a good thing to do if you're looking for something to do on the extra credit board would be to look through some of these words and figure out some of the meanings and think about how they might connect to this idea and how they might connect to the image that we see. And by the way, this is a self-portrait, so that's Lorna Simpson right there. The second image, as you can see, it says serigraph. That just means a, um, a print on six felt panels. Uh, so it's pretty huge, 67 by 67, so um, almost as tall as me. Uh, so the best way to take these images, uh, this particular one, is to take a look at it on her website. So let's do that. So on her website, she has the image, and I'll link to this in the um, description for the video. It shows the picture. And it's actually taken from her Central Park apartment at that time. <laughs> at a time, I mean, Central Park apartments were really expensive in the 1990s, but um, I don't know if she's still there because it's it might be too expensive nowadays. Um, but she is a pretty well-off artist. So we're seeing it from her window. Uh, we're seeing this picture down into Central Park and all of the buildings behind it. So she has a couple of different signs with writing on it. There's one here on the left and another one on the right. Uh, so let's take a look at those signs. So the first one is just unpacked a shiny, a new shiny silver telescope. And we are up high enough for a really good view of all the buildings in the park. The living room window seems to be the best spot for it. On the sidewalk below, a man watches figures from across the path. So I ask you, what do you think about this? Um, most of the time when people see this, they think, oh, this is a pretty cool little scene. This is like kids, they got this cool telescope. And I know when, when I had an uncle that gave us a cool telescope, the first thing you do is start looking around and, and saying, oh my gosh, look at that house all the way down there. I want to see it close up. Um, so most of the time people see this as being um, somewhat innocent or wholesome. And then if you look at the sign on the right, it says, it is early evening. The lone sociologist walks through the park to observe private acts in men's public bathrooms. These facilities are men's and women's rooms back to back. He focuses on the layout of the men's room, right to left, basin, urinal, 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 stall, stall. He decides to adopt the role of voyeur and to look out in order to go unnoticed and notice at the same time. His research takes several years. He names the subjects A, B, C, X, Y, and O, and records their activities for now and their license plates when applicable for later. So this could be another time you could pause and think about what does this make you think? So you can start again. So when I usually have this in class, most of the time people read this and they think it's not very innocent. Even though he's a lone sociologist, they think this person may be like a pervert or even a serial killer 
or some kind of narc for the government because he says he records their activities now and their license plates. Uh, so it seemed to be something that there's someone here as, who is violating people's um, privacy, uh, perhaps trying to look in on activities that people want to keep secret. Um, so by placing the images and words together, we can see one thing is this kind of wholesome image of a couple of kids with a telescope. And then the other one, we can imagine this person who is maybe a scientist, maybe a serial killer, who is violating people's privacy and perhaps um, going to do worse. So that's one idea Lorna Simpson likes to bring out these ideas. When you place words against images, it can change the meaning of the images. So this idea of primacy of images over words. Uh, and I think most people believe that there is a primacy of images over words. Um, so a good way to do this is, for instance, if someone, um, anyone around the world, if you show them this and they live in a place where there are trees, will they recognize this as a tree? Yes, they will. Uh, if you show them this, it's just a line drawing. But if they live in a place where there are trees, I think they'll recognize that as a tree. Um, what about this one anywhere in the world? Well, if you can speak and read English, then this is a tree. Uh, but if you don't know how to speak or read English, uh, which is a few billion people, then you don't know what this is. So that's the idea of primacy of images over words. Uh, images commu can communicate uh, sometimes more clearly, even if it's a relatively simplistic image. So this one shows how images could lie. Uh, and this is something you can think about in media all the time. Um, think about, hey, I'm seeing a picture and it's from this part of the world. Uh, one way to look at it is say, you know, think about this little exercise. Think about what be, might be missing from the picture. Uh, so this is Dwayne Michaels, uh, who's a photographer working in the 1970s and 1960s. And he calls this picture, this photograph is my proof. Um, so what he's saying on the photograph, he says, this photograph is my proof. There was this afternoon when things were still good between us and she embraced me and we were so happy. It did happen. She did love me. Look, see for yourself. Um, so... What do you think about this picture? Does this prove uh, what the person is saying? I think if you look at it for a while, you could say, no, it doesn't necessarily prove that. Um, for all we know, this could be a picture of one of his friends uh, that isn't in love with him or a sister or something like that. Or he could have bought a sex worker and had her pose for the picture. Um, none of this tells us that this photograph is proof. We just see a dude um, and a lady who's hugging him from behind. We don't actually get the rest of this story from this picture. Uh, so Dwayne is trying to be a little smart here by saying this photograph is my proof. Well, it's not really proof of anything. <laughs> it's just a picture. Uh, so what we're looking at is the subject matter versus the content. Uh, so the subject, he says, this is um, him, assuming in this picture, and then some kind of girlfriend that he had before. So that's the subject. Um, but what is the content? Um, and you can actually make the subject more simple. You could say the subject is just some dude and some lady, and they're staying in a bed. Looks like a hotel room. It's a very mushy bed as well. So that could be a very simple way to describe the subject. Um, so the subject is a literal visible image in a work of art as distinguished from its content. But the content is the themes or ideas in the work of art is distinct from its form. Uh, so the content of it, you could say, if you took it literally, you could say the content is, this is my proof for this girlfriend. But I think if you think about it for a while, the content is actually, no, <laughs> this, he's being ironic. The photograph is not proof of anything. He's showing that photographs um, can, be used to support a story, even if they don't actually support that particular story. 
Um, so this is something to think about in general. Uh, you can look at it as images, or you can look at it when people are making speeches, or when someone like your professor is talking. Um, there could be a subject, but there's also content. There's a meaning behind what is there. And sometimes the content is intended uh, by the artist or speaker or creator, and sometimes it isn't. Um, and sometimes there's both. There's a content that's intended by a creator, and then the audience will get different contents from it. So content is meaning. And then form is just what we're looking at in the picture. It's the colors. Um, it's black and white shadows. Um, we see that there's a couple of people centered in the frame. Um, so that's the, the form. So artists use many different ways to describe the world. Uh, one way is representational. Uh, so types of representational art that you can see is, is sometimes people will use the word realistic. Uh, we'll talk about realism, which is an art movement later, and that's a little different. Naturalistic, which means it's a looks like the natural world. And then illusionistic, where it's trying to fool you into looking like the natural world. And I'll have um, these definitions written on the slide later. Abstract, where things are stylized or simplified. And then not objective, where there's not a relation to the real, real world. Um, the picture or sculpture is completely abstracted. So let's see some examples of these. Uh, so this is uh, John Ahern and Rigoberto Torres. Uh, and they do this cool project where uh, they found a bunch of people in their Boca neighborhood. And they decided they were going to basically make exact copies of them. And how they did it is they put a cast on everybody. So basically, um, they cover you with something and then they put a mold on you. Um, and then they take the mold off um, and they put plaster inside of the mold and wait for it to dry. And then when they take it off, um, the plaster will just be like white or gray or something like that. It'll be exactly you copied. Uh, and then they had taken pictures whenever they did this for everybody and they painted everybody's clothes and skin and hair. Um, so this is an example of First off, it's representational art because if you were in 1982 in that Brooklyn neighborhood um, and you saw Pat walking down the street, you would recognize her, it looks like her. Uh, so naturalistic is a brand of representation in which the artist retains apparently realistic elements but presents the visual world from a distinctly personal or subjective point of view. Um, in my opinion, uh, the last part, distinctly personal or subjective, doesn't have to be part of naturalistic. Uh, but the text I was using is. So for me, it's just um, if it looks like it's representing something in the real world. Now, illusionistic is a type of naturalistic art. Uh, and this is the case of that. Um, like if you walked up to this and you just saw it from the waist up, um, especially if you knew Pat, you, you would be like, oh my gosh, Pat's right there. Um, strangely still but right there. So that's a reference to illusionistic. It's a painting or a sculpture that creates an illusion of a real object or scene or a sculpture where the artist has depicted a figure in such a realistic way that they seem alive. Um, so those of you who are ever go to um, the modern art sections and museums, sometimes you'll see sculptures like this uh, and they'll even have clothes on them and and they can really fool you. <laughs> you can get a little creeped out and think that there's a real person sitting in a chair over there. Another way to say this is from the French, uh, trompe l'oeil, which means fool the eye. So the idea with illusionistic art is to make it look very real. They're not always successful, but we're talking about the attempt with illusionistic art. So abstract art, um, the example we're using is Mary Soul Escobar, uh, who has lots of great pieces like this with assemblages of figures like this. It's called a baby girl. So abstract is in art, the rendering of images and objects in a stylized or simplified way so that though they remain recognizable, their formal or expressive aspects are emphasized. So this is the perfect image to um, talk about abstract because if you look at this sculpture, you're not going to think that's a real baby. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, maybe if you're playing too many video games, you might think that's a, a real baby. I, but I think most people don't think that babies are rectangles like this. However, there's no doubt 
that the artist tried to make a representation of a baby. Um, so it's abstracted in that, in that, you know, babies don't actually look like this, um, but we do recognize it as a baby. So normally when we say abstract art, we mean you can see what it is, uh, but it's stylized in some way. Um, it doesn't represent the world exactly as it is. So you can compare abstract art to representational, uh, any work of art that seeks to resemble the world of natural appearance. Um, so this isn't quite representational. We get an idea of a baby, but it doesn't look like a baby. Uh, and then non-objective art, art that makes no uh, reference to the natural world, also known as non-representational art. So let's take a look at something that might be representational or might be non-objective. So this piece from Joel Sapiro, which is conveniently titled, Unentitled, um, from 1982, when you first look at it, it's bronze. It basically looks like a bunch of, if it looks like a bunch of four by fours to you, that's because it was probably molded using four by fours, you can see right here. Um, but a lot of times people see it and they see it as representing something. Uh, so you might wanna pause it right here and then think about some things. So when I've showed this to other classes in person, sometimes people see this as like kind of a hangman, as this the noose, and then this is the neck, and then someone's hanging. Other people see it as like a dancer or a puppet, a marionette. Um, so even though this is technically non-objective, I mean, it's just a bunch of four by fours cast into bronze uh, because uh, Shapiro shaped it in a way where we can almost see limbs or something along those lines. We do kind of see it as representational. So this is another example of non-objective art. Uh, and again, the intention was, um, this is literally like six by sixes in this case, uh, from Carl Andre uh, Redon. Um, and that's all it is. You know, what you see is what you get. However, he names it Redon. Um, so even though it's non-objective, it doesn't make any reference to the real world. Um, I mean, it's a bunch of six by sixes, but it doesn't, he doesn't use the six by sixes to make a picture of anything. Um, but he names it Redon, and it's a work having two parapets whose faces unite so as to form a salient angle towards the enemy. So basically, it's like ramparts. Um, so something to protect you when you're in war. So yeah, it kind of looks like that, um, but it kind of doesn't look like anything at all. Uh, so the idea with making non-objective art sometimes uh, is to get the person who's looking at it to kind of concentrate on the formal elements. So we talked about this before. Form is line, shape, color, um, and the compositional principles. So how you arrange the line, shape, and color. So we can get some better examples than this one, possibly. Uh, this is a pretty good example. It's Malevich. Uh, and he called all his pictures suprematists. Um, we don't have to get into that now, but maybe we will a little bit later when we get to modern art. Uh, black rectangle and blue triangle. Uh, so truth and description, we do see a black rectangle and a blue triangle right there. Um, so form is the materials used to make a work of art, the ways in which these materials are utilized in terms of the formal elements, line, light, color, et cetera, and the composition that results. So that's the form. So when you're talking about form, you're talking about lines, you're talking about colors, in some ways, this picture is all form. There isn't anything there. I mean, there, there is like a content that Malevich um, intended, uh, but you know, it's not something that would be clear, I don't think, to most people. Um, and then as far as the subject, <laughs> beyond the fact that it's a black rectangle and a blue triangle, we don't really know. So it's almost pure form in a way. Um, but Malevich, his idea with these types of pictures was he was Russian. Uh, and in Russia, they have these images of saints uh, called icons. And people used to have them in their houses in Russia uh, at certain, you know, kind of places in the room. Um, but he was thinking, well, if people aren't Christian, they're not really going to understand images like that. Um, so what do you, or if they're not Russian, even they might not understand. So he wanted to figure out a way to be able to communicate universally. So you may agree or not agree that he's communicating something universally, uh, but his idea was by just using form, just colors and shapes, 
uh, that you could speak to more people in an international audience. So when people first see this, they're like, I could do that. And you could, you know, but um, sometimes we look at images where we definitely see it as something that's art. This is Claude Monet and this is grain stack. Um, and he has a whole series of these with different times of day. So you can see different colors. Uh, so it's somewhat abstracted, like it doesn't look like the real world, but it also does represent things in the real world, like um, this grain stack and some of the houses in the background. And you can recognize a hill back there, and this is the bright sky. Uh, we know that it's either early in the day or late in the day because of this long shadow. So it does represent something. Um, and But Monet, when he's making these pictures, it does look a little bit flattened. Uh, so even though it's 3D, we see those houses in the background, it also seems like all of this paint is just a design that kind of sits on the canvas. Uh, so if we turn it on its side, we can actually compare it to Malevich. Uh, these are very similar pictures as far as composition goes. And composition means how you arrange the elements of the picture. Um, so they did the same thing. Uh, they basically have a triangle with a bunch of uh, with a few rectangles here and one rectangle here. Uh, but it kind of gives you an idea how, even when something's non objective, uh, it can have a certain amount of appeal to it. If you're looking for more that's like this, you can look up the artist uh, Pete Mondrian. Uh, Pete is spelled P I E T, and then Mondrian is like it sounds M O N D R I A N. Uh, and look at some of his art, which I'm sure you've seen before, even if you didn't know the name. And you can see that it's not objective, but most people do find it appealing. So this one, um, as far as the original source of this African mask, um, the text I used to use, it said song people, uh, but there isn't such a people. So um, I looked up a few and it's kind of similar to some masks. Uh, in some African cultures, but wasn't able to nail it down or anything like that. Um, so we see this African mask, and then below we see Apollo. Um, it's a Roman copy of a fourth century Greek original, which would have been originally done in bronze, uh, so a Roman copy. I'm going to read from my old textbook to kind of explain what's going on with this image. Uh, so when we're, we're looking at it, we can understand it a little bit better. Uh, so we have this uh, Western art historian who was also an artist uh, in the um, 19th and 20th century. Um, so in the late 60s, uh, there was this television series with the art historian Kenneth Clark. Um, and he was looking at both of these images and he was looking at it from what's called an ethnocentric lens. Uh, so he compared um, the image of the messenger god, Apollo, uh, and to him, it demonstrated the superiority of classical Greek civilization. Um, so Clark understood the convention of Greek sculpture and recognized the meaning of the idealized sculpture form. However, his interpretation of the African mass, he, which he owned, reveals his ignorance of the conventions of the West African nation that created it. And this is what they, he said on a TV show in the 1960s. To the Negro imagination is a word of fear and darkness, ready to inflict horrible punishment for the smallest infringement of its hat's taboo. Um, so he has no idea uh, what this piece means. He's just making an assumption based on the conventions. So conventions are a traditional, habitual, widely accepted method of representation that he understands from this ancient Greek and Roman sculpture, whereas um, he just assumes that these conventions apply to um, the African match, which they don't. Um, and I teach a class in African art and I show another one where there's images are very similar to this, uh, but later artists chose to make abstracted images because they wanted to have more meaning. Um, and that's a different convention. Uh, and the text I used to use uses the word ethnocentric uh, to describe Clark's view. Uh, but that's too weak of a word. Um, Clark is expressing white supremacy uh, when he looks at this picture and this sculpture and says, this is perfect. Uh, and this one is a representation of fear. 
So masks like this in Africa, oftentimes they'll have um, these abstracted images, but each part of the image will have a different meaning. And sometimes they'll represent um, spiritual ideas or psychological states. Um, so this is a pretty good example. Uh, this is the Nagil mass from the Fang uh, in Gabon. Uh, and the Nagil is a judicial and policing uh, fraternal organization. So a lot of West African societies have these, uh, instead of having cops and courts, um, they have people that get together, usually like elders, but also young people of a town or village or city. Uh, and they kind of adjudicate problems. Uh, so you never have these um, police or courts that are separate from everybody else. They are people you know. Uh, so then the gill represents gorilla. Uh, and there's a lot of mythologies that are around gorillas uh, amongst the Fang and other, there's a few other um, West African cultures that use this sort of idea. Uh, so the gorilla, it eradicates evil and horrifies those who face it. So they have these masks um, as part of ceremonies that are related to um, these judicial and policing fraternal organizations. When I say policing, that's not the right word because the way that modern police function um, where they're basically unaccountable and an oppressive force isn't the same way as these. In other words, these are, are you know, if you have disagreements or there's someone that is violent, um, these are kind of large groups of people uh, who are deciding these types of ideas. And then they're usually someone you know or someone that's related to you. So all of these types of images um, are made in a way that is according to conventions. So whatever the society thinks uh, art should look like uh, and how it should be created, uh, how it should compare to other artists and what it should mean, uh, those are conventions. And once you understand those, you can understand whether or not art is good or not. So good according to the conventions of the society that made it. So some of the conventions in Western art are that so-called ugly things. Uh, and this is Leonardo da Vinci's uh, five characters in a comic scene. He's trying to make everybody look like less than ideal. So, you know, kind of like old dudes with like floppy skin and not the best shaped noses. Uh, and, you know, giant chins and beady eyes uh, and, you know, maybe not the best hair. Uh, so the convention in Western art um, through the Renaissance, not later, uh, is that ugliness equals bad. And a lot, of, a lot of cultures aren't like that. Sometimes things that look ugly are good. Uh, and you can even see that in um, like a lot of music. <laughs> like if you're a heavy metal fan, sometimes ugly is really good. So iconography. Sorry, I got ahead a little bit here. So iconography, we're going to use uh, Jan van Eyck's um, painting called The Portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife Giovanna uh, Tenami, uh, the Arnolfini marriage. Uh, Italian I know is sometimes better than French. <laughs> uh, so this is from the 15th century. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is naturalistic art. We can see it maybe doesn't look exactly how they did in real life, but it does attempt to um, represent the natural world. But even if you didn't know uh, when this painting was made uh, in the 15th century and what culture was making it, uh, there are ways to be able to figure that out. And one of the ways is iconography. So the images and symbols conventionally associated with a given subject. Uh, so iconography means that images have symbols. Um, and it could also be colors and lines have symbols. And the important thing to understand about iconography is that this symbol has meaning for the culture in which it was made. But if you go to a different culture or the same culture in a different time, it may have a different meaning. Uh, and even if somebody's like really well educated or very poor and not well educated, uh, they might have different meanings for iconography as well. So in this particular picture, it's supposed to represent um, not the actual marriage, uh, but before they're getting married, more or less. And um, it's a picture that shows, hey, we're going to get married. <laughs> and if you're rich like these guys, 
uh, these people are, you can get paintings like this made. So the green represents fertility. Uh, the woman in this picture is not pregnant, uh, but she's kind of has her dress folded up to represent, we're going to make some babies. Uh, and when rich people get together, that's what they want. Uh, they don't care if you love each other. Uh, they just want to have heirs so they can have something um, to give to people, whatever their, their business is or title. So neither of them is wearing shoes, and you can see that their shoes are taken off. That represents holy ground. Uh, so even this is basically, even though this is basically a business deal, they want to say that um, Jesus said that this marriage is the good thing to do. Um, the single candle in the candelabra, you can see there's a bunch of ones missing. That represents Christ. Uh, and then the dog represents faithfulness and marital fidelity. Um, so there's a couple of other pieces if you get close of iconography. Uh, first off, there's a super cool signature. Jan van Eyck was here, 1434. Uh, and then you can see some beads and a sweep. Uh, a lot of times these types of images, depending on the time period, will be, I'm trying to sweep away evil spirits. Um, and then the beads may represent like uh, prayer beads or something along those lines. In this mirror, you can see the reverse and then the other people that are attending um, this announcement for their marriage. So iconography, um, and even when you look at like the fancy expensive fur coat this dude's wearing and the hat, um, the oranges in the background, oranges were expensive. Um, all these images of iconography can kind of let you know what um, this picture is supposed to mean, but it also helps you identify the culture. So an example, this is Buddha sheltered by Mukulinda, the serpent king. Um, there's a lot of pictures uh, and sculptures like this in Buddhist art, which represents um, kind of different events in the Buddha's life. Uh, so each Buddha from all cultures share similar iconography, such as stretched ears. You can see that right here. Uh, a third eye, um, this little like hump on the top of their head, uh, which is to represent a spiritual brain. Um, and the way that they're sitting as well. Uh, but this particular Buddha is a Cambodian style. Uh, and you can tell by this crown, uh, which is like what Cambodian kings wore. Um, and then the particular jewels they wear in that style. And then even the face shape is exactly like you would see in Cambodia, like an Angkor Wat. So each culture, and they kind of do, Christians do this as well with Jesus. Each culture makes Buddha look kind of more like themselves or more like what um, is in the art that is ideal in the art. Um, so some more iconography that would tell a Buddhist is pretty specific, what type of Buddha this is or what it's supposed to represent. It's a Buddha of healing. Um, and I don't really read Sanskrit, so I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> uh, and we know it's a Buddha of healing because he has a medicine jar right here. Uh, and snakes are protective. It's believed in Buddhist mythology that whenever Buddha reached enlightenment, he was protected by a snake, uh, a cobra, who kind of had their hood um, over Buddha and shielded him from the weather and um, things that were stopping him. Uh, so you can read that story here. So this particular piece, just a few things. It's cast in three parts. Um, you make this part solid so it doesn't fall over. Uh, and the last piece of iconography is the mudra. Uh, so the mudra in this case, um, is the Buddha of healing. Uh, so when he puts his hands in there, like he does for meditation, but he's got medicine in there, that mudra means um, that it is the Buddha of healing. If he didn't have this here, then it would be a Buddha of meditation. So the mudra is the various hand positions of the Buddha. Uh, there's another mudra that you can see where you can. it looks like um, Buddha is, he has each of his first fingers out uh, and it looks like he's spinning them together. Uh, that's another mudra, mudra that represents the Buddha of the wheel of the law. So each of these mudras has a different meaning. And if you're Buddhist, you can kind of understand what it is and what this Buddha is supposed to represent. Um, so here's another one, this mudra where he's got one hand um, down towards the earth and the other hand in a meditation pose, a spiritual pose. It means calling on the earth to witness. Um, so a lot of cultures kind of do that. You point down at the earth for that kind of idea. Um, 
So this one's kind of interesting. If you have a Christian background, or perhaps even if you have an Islamic background, you might be able to see uh, what some of these images are based on the iconography. Um, so all of these panels that we're seeing uh, in Shark Cathedral, um, and this is stained glass, they represent a story uh, in um, Jesus's life. Uh, so I'll just pick out a couple of them. Um, but the reason why you can pick them out is because of the iconography. So I'll kind of point some of that out. So this one right here, we see a woman uh, and she's all wrapped up. And then we see a dude with a beard and then um, a little kid who's also wrapped up. Um, and that is Jesus who had been born in a manger and he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. So when you see that little baby wrapped up like that, the woman and then a dude and these little uh, halos are also pieces of iconography. They say they're sp spiritual figures. Uh, and we have a bunch of other ones like this. We have the angel Gabriel telling Mar Mary that she's about to be pregnant. Uh, we can tell this is an angel because of the wings. Those are pieces of iconography uh, and the halo again. And then we can tell this is Mary because of the color she's wearing, blue and pink. Uh, and because um, she has a halo over her head saying that she's spiritual. So you can probably guess some of these other ones. And they're all from the story of Jesus being born. So again, if you're Christian, uh, you probably know these stories. Uh, if you're Islamic, you might also know some of them. There is a little bit of carryover with some of these stories uh, into the Quran. So if you're looking for something to do on the extra credit board, pick out some of the other stories and show what the iconography is. So I'm going to use these two pictures to kind of bring all of these ideas together uh, so that we can understand things a little bit better. Uh, so this is the artist, uh, John Taylor who's um, representing a real event, uh, the treaty signing at Medicine Creek Lodge in 1867. Just as a side note, you may know that a lot of these treaties uh, were not exactly signed um, under the best of conditions. And also uh, many of the treaties were almost immediately broken um, by the US uh, when they made treaties with Native Americans. So in this picture, you can see that John Taylor portrays it in a way that's according to the conventions of his society. So it looks pretty realistic. Um, he's showing some um, Native Americans uh, on the side and we see a bunch of dudes over here. This, this is a dude, he's just got really pretty hair. Um, and we can tell by their hats and beards, uh, there's all dudes right here. And then, but what's interesting is when he shows the Native Americans, he's only showing men as well. Um, and it's pretty realistic. It looks kind of 3D. Uh, we see it in the woods. Uh, and the focus, of course, is on the white guy because John Taylor's a white guy. So if you move to another image of the same event uh, that's created by Howling Wolf, uh, not the blues artist, um, but he's another figure, uh, the training signing at the Medicine Creek Lodge, who's Native American. And he's portraying things according to the own conventions of his society and also showing what is important. So what's interesting, um, he made this while in prison from memory many years later. Uh, so you kind of figure out what happened to that treaty. Um, and he's showing the things that are important to him. Uh, so let's compare these two images, the same event, different views. We just see a bunch of people gathered like they're signing the Declaration of Independence or something like that. Whereas Highland Wolf, he has other important things that he wants to portray. Um, first off, he shows women because uh, among this particular Native American group, women are there making decisions with men. Uh, but since that's not something that Westerners did, uh, that people in the U.S. did in 1867, um, John Taylor doesn't even see that, even though they were literally there. Uh, he doesn't show the women as being prominent in this particular case. Um, he's also showing uh, the rivers that it was located at. Um, that is very important to him. Um, he's showing the colors of different families uh, on their dwellings. That's also important because it shows who was there. Um, so even though this piece is a little bit more, or a lot bit more abstract, it gives us a lot, a lot more information about what actually happened. Whereas this one, they're trying to show the event, but first off, even though it looks realistic, it's not accurate to the events that happened. And it also doesn't give us much information other than um, a white guy is pointing and everybody's looking at him. <laughs> um, we seriously don't get much uh, from this picture. 
Uh, so this is an idea of the way of thinking of visual literacy, being able to read images, uh, and it helps to know culture to be able to read images, um, but also how different artists and different cultures visualize the world. So that's the end of this first lecture.